Good evening. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters, Austin Globe, questions via email, distinguished guests this, e this evening. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. I'm so pleased to extend a warm virtual welcome to Anthea Butler, Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. A historian of African-American and American religion, her research and writing spans African-American religion and history, race, politics, and evangelicalism. You can see her on the recent PBS series, The Black Church in America, as well as the May 2021 American Experience on Billy Graham. Her most recent book, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America, was released today. So that's an exciting moment. I'm also delighted to welcome E.J. Dion back to the library virtually. He writes about politics in a twice weekly column for the Washington Post. He is also a government professor at Georgetown University, a visiting professor at Harvard University, a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution, and a frequent commentator on politics for National Public Radio and MSNBC. The author of many books and editor of many more, his most recent book is Code Red, How Progressives and Moderates Can Unite to Save Our Country. It is also a pleasure to welcome Patrick Lacroix. He is a scholar of US religious history. He studies faith and its role in 20th century political realignments and is the author of the new book, John F. Kennedy and the Politics of Faith. He has brought historical perspective to the current state of religious activism in a number of outlets, including the History News Network, time.com, the Washington Post, and the Concord Monitor. He is also a leading scholar of Franco-American history on which he has published in numerous journals. I'm so pleased to welcome Emmett G. Price III, Professor of Worship, Church and Culture, and Founding Executive Director of the Institute for the Study of the Black Christian Experience at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, one of the nation's leading experts on music of the African diaspora, Christian worship, and the Black Christian experience. He is founding pastor of Community of Love Christian Fellowship and is a weekly contributor on WGBH's Boston Public Radio. He is also an executive producer and co-host of the All Revved Up podcast. I'm also delighted to welcome Sim Simran Jeet Singh, recognized among Time Magazine's 16 people fighting for a more equal America. He is senior advisor for equity and inclusion at YSC Consulting, a visiting professor at Union Seminary, and a senior fellow for the Sikh Coalition. The author of the best-selling children's book, Fauja Singh Keeps Going, the true story of the oldest person to ever run a marathon. He is also a columnist for the Religion News Service. His work has been featured in numerous outlets, including NPR, CNN, BBC, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. Finally, I'm so pleased to welcome back Marjorie Egan, our moderator for this evening's discussion. This evening, she is the co-host of 89.7 WGBH's midday program, Boston Public Radio. She has written for many publications during her distinguished career and was the Catholic spirituality columnist for the Boston Globe's website, Crux Now. In 2015, she won first place for excellence in religion commentary at the Religion Newswriters Association annual conference in Philadelphia. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. So I guess we're about to begin here. Thank you everybody for tuning in tonight. I hope this is a informative evening for you. Just give you the lay of the land a little bit. We're gonna talk about, as you know, the intersection of religion and politics, starting with current events, you know, the election uh, 2020, uh, religious freedom, the Supreme Court, look back a little bit uh, at the time when JFK, we're at the JFK Library virtually, talk about uh, religion in America at the time of, of JFK's presidency, and then look forward to the intersection of religion and politics uh, ahead of us 
then of course we're gonna take your questions and I hope that, as I said before, this is gonna be a, a informative evening for everyone who's tuned in. Um, so let's start with the election uh, 2020. The uh, tremendous support that uh, former President Trump in both 2016 and again in 2020, I uh, got from white evangelical Chris, uh, Christians. Um, I know, Anthea, you don't want to spend the whole evening talking about evangelicals, but this does play into your brand new book, Congratulations, which just came out today. So let's start with you and anybody can jump in after that. What about that overwhelming support from white evangelicals that went to President, former President Trump in both yeah. elections? Yeah, thank you, Marjorie. I'm happy to be here. I think that what people thought might would happen during this uh, 2020 election cycle is that maybe evangelicals would step away from Donald Trump, that they would leave the person who bought them a, a Supreme Court justices, bought them laws that they wanted and everything else. But I'm here to tell you that that relationship is solid. They are not breaking up. As a matter of fact, they're not only not breaking up, 81% of them voted for uh, Donald Trump this time around. And this leaves them with a dilemma because Donald Trump did not win the election. And so I think what we need to understand about evangelicals is that there was a lot of hand wringing that happened back in 2016 when um, evangelical support for Donald Trump back then was right about the same, around the same percentage. And I think what people don't understand is that Donald Trump really was just the apotheosis of everything that evangelicals wanted. Evangelicals had struggled for a long time to have someone who was able to do the things that they wanted to do. And in a sense, what I'm trying to talk about in my new book is that everybody thought this was about morality. Everybody thought it was about abortion. Everybody thought it was about same-sex marriage. All of those things mattered, but the way and the utility that morality played for evangelicals to get power into politics is a really important point. They didn't care about having a moral president. They cared about a president who would deliver for them. And Donald Trump delivered everything that they wanted and then some. And so their support for him was unwavering. It didn't matter if he had three wives. It didn't matter what he said about women. It didn't matter that he was racist. As a matter of fact, it actually helped them because it set up the high boundaries that they think about. And it also reaffirmed something very important to them, their Christianity and the linkage of that with whiteness and nationalism. And so I think all of those things came together in the election cycle to hold evangelicals closer to Donald Trump. There was a very, Emmett, you and I are, are partners in crime on, the, on Boston Public Radio. We've spoken a lot about the difference between white evangelicals, black evangelicals. Uh, the black vote was, was pivotal to Joe Biden's win. Let's, let's talk about that difference though between, I think sometimes evangelicals and some people's minds get bunched all together. And yeah, yeah, you know, and, and thank you for the invitation to be here. The, you know, the terminology evangelical or evangelical has a very problematic history. Um, many of the um, patriarchs of evangelicalism were slaveholders. So, you know, whether you talk about Cotton Mather, you talk about Jonathan Edwards, you talk about George Whitefield, you talk about so many others. And so in that sense, what most people would articulate who are outside of the white evangelical political power dynamic bubble, let me just say that, would say that they believe in the authority of scripture, that they believe in the central role of Jesus Christ, that they believe in this notion of activism, right? And, and you know, go ye therefore and make disciples. And they believe in the conversion narrative. And so in those four areas, which people talk about the Babington quadrilateral, you got people well beyond whiteness you know, who, who, who believe in those things, except for the fact that we are not invited to the party. We don't have the evangelical ID card. And so that becomes an interesting dynamic of evangelicalism as a movement and not as a dom denomination. Now, the challenge of the power dynamic, I mean, we can go back to, the, to Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan presidential election. Jimmy Carter was the evangelical, but the evangelicals voted for Ronald Reagan. So the notion of power dynamic, as Dr. Butler has said, goes well beyond this sense of loyalty to morality and this conviction of, you know, the, the biblical narrative. So we have a lot of coded language that's going on. We have a lot of gaslighting that's going on. We have a lot of other stuff that has nothing to do with theology, that has nothing to do with the Bible, and has everything to do with this notion of power dynamic, who controls the narrative, who has the power, and whoever desires or designs to have the power, then we need to, 
you know, get that people, give those people to vote. And so, I mean, it, this, this is an interesting challenge, you know, for us when we think about the conflation of, you know, um, you know, religion and politics. Anybody else want to jump in here? Yeah, a couple of things. First of all, uh, it is great to be with this extraordinary group and with you, Marjorie. If you had a session on basket weaving, I'd study basket weaving just to be with you. So it's oh, great. My goodness, to, it's great to be here. I wouldn't be able to do it, but I'd study up on it. Um, and forgive the sun that is just falling. I like to think it's the Holy Spirit inspiring me, but it's actually just glare. Um, a couple of things on this. I think the word that you need to focus on here is white, uh, because white evangelicals voted one way, black evangelicals voted another way. To only a slight, a somewhat lesser degree, white Catholics voted one way, Latino and black Catholics voted another way. There were, you know, Trump got a share of the Latino vote this time that was not trivial, but there is this split and that uh, further on the evangelicals, if you go historically, um, there was a wing of evangelicalism in the North that was strongly anti-slavery. Um, but uh, evangelicalism in the South was overwhelmingly pro-slavery. Uh, and we actually had splits in the denominations in the fight over slavery, which is how you got Southern Baptists, Southern Methodists, uh, and the like. So these splits around race and racial justice and slavery go back a long way. And Donald Trump's share of the white evangelical vote was really not all that different, um, as Emmett suggested, than the share that Mitt Romney got, than the share that George W. Bush got. And we thought, we, many of us outside the tradition, their tra uh, the evangelical tradition, that, well, gee, Trump behaves in a certain way, that's got to turn some people off. But I think Anthony is absolutely right. This was a constituency that wanted certain things. They wanted judges and they got the judges. Uh, they wanted public policies that defined religious liberty in a way that gave an awful lot of room to conservative evangelical churches and they got that. And so they, and, and also I think there was a feeling uh, that the broader culture, you know, the culture of the North, the culture of the universities, the culture of the big cities um, was against them. And they liked Donald Trump for owning the libs time after time after time. And I think you just cannot underestimate the power of owning the libs mm -hmm. in pushing an awful lot of conservative evangelicals toward Donald Trump. You know, I think it's one of the <clears throat> phenomenons that's hard for many people to understand uh, is, is because you look at the Bible, needless to say, and then you look at one of the positions that, uh, that the white evangelicals are holding, it's hard to reconcile them. Simran Singh, you wrote a great column about the attack on the Capitol. And as we know, many of the people who were there um, attacking police officers and, and being quite violent were self-identified Christians. Tell us about the piece you wrote on the, um, this is who we are, this is not who we are. Explain that to people. I appreciate, I appreciate that invitation. Thank you. And, and I'll say, um, to, to add another layer to the conversation so far, I, I think we're missing a critical component if we're not thinking about uh, race, as has been mentioned, um, and uh, underrepresented and disempowered religious groups. And so, you know, one of, one of, the, one of the phenomenon we've witnessed this past election that's worth noting uh, just in, in response to the conversation that's been happening, um, is that um, the, the, the emergence of voter blocks uh, and, and influence in ways we haven't seen before historically, right? So a majority of the credit uh, for the swing um, in, in swing states has gone to black voters and, and rightfully so. But there are many significant gains made by minoritized groups uh, in their ability to deliver the, the vote. And perhaps the most influential of that is, is the Muslim American bloc. Uh, in 2016, an estimated 400,000 Muslim Americans voted in the presidential election. In 2018, that number, is, that number doubled to approximately 800,000 Muslim voters. And these numbers are staggering in their own right, but they're especially consequential in that large proportions of these numbers come from Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Georgia, Ohio, North Carolina, and other swing states. 
And, and in, in Michigan, it's perhaps the most interesting example where an estimated 800,000 Muslim Americans uh, voted via mail-in ballot alone. In 2016, Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump in Michigan by 11,000 votes. And this year, Joe Biden took Michigan handily, gaining more than 550,000 votes more than Trump. And so I think there's something really important for us to recognize there in terms of, of religious diversity and its role in shaping this election and going forward. And I think that ties into your question, Marjorie, regarding, regarding the capital attacks and, and the emergence of white nationalism as, as a real power holder in this country. And, and the point that I made in the column, uh, and, and I think the point that I'd like to make here is that our, our instinct uh, as a society and as a culture is so quick to respond and say, that's not who we are as a country that we are not about racism and we are not about white supremacy and this has nothing to do with religion. But I think the reality is when we, when we dig underneath and look at what's actually happening on the ground, this is who we are, this is what we've been. And if you deny that you haven't been paying attention because the violence of white supremacy against minoritized groups, whether on the base of race or religion or otherwise of sexual orientation of, of of any sort of identity group, this, this has been very much the foundation of the country from, from its very outset. And I think, you know, I, I appreciate the sentiment. I, I feel that impulse as well as someone who's been born and raised in this country to say, this is not who we are, these are not our values. And they're not, right? This is not what America aspires to be. But I think the entire purpose of looking into a mirror is to see things that we are unable to see otherwise. And when we ignore our deformities, white supremacy and white nationalism as they stare us in the face is to knowingly harm ourselves. And then the last thing just to sort of round out this point is that for, for those of us who have been paying attention and who have been studying the history of this country and its present, there really are two different Americas, right? There's, there is an America for those who are in positions of power, and this goes back to Emmett's point around the power dynamics, right? Those who have historically had the power enjoy freedoms in this country that many of us don't. And, and the way this plays out in our lives and our, in our daily living uh, is incredibly disparate. It's inequitable. And I think that is a question that our country is grappling with right now. Emmett, were you motioning at me? I, I was, Marge. I just want to say hello and 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 and, and get a quick get a quick point in because uh, what, what Simran just was hit on is an interesting dynamic of how lazy we are as Americans that we would synopsize American history into the reds, the yellows, the blacks, and the whites without doing a, a, a more complicated dive. So when we think about the constitution of this great nation. The, the folks who were considered citizens were not just white people. It was land owning white males. So, so even the challenge within whiteness, in many ways, the election in 2016 kind of turned whiteness on its, on its side because there were some white folks who didn't feel like they had you know, received the privilege of whiteness and we can debate that, but, but, but part of that vote was around there. And then we still have not dealt with the gender dynamic. So when people talk about the black vote, we need to talk about the black women vote. I mean, and be honest about that and, and, and be honest about that power block within the notion of these communities that are not just domestic African-American, but Afro-diasporic. And the way that women have played a significant, critical and amazing role in sustaining our communities, not just politically, but in every way, economically, et cetera. And so I think that when we oversimplify uh, these conversations in terms of the reds, the yellows, the blacks, and the whites, we do a disservice in terms of what's really going on you know, beneath the surface and, and in paying attention to the details. You know, we mentioned um, before we went on the air, <clears throat> the diversity of religions in the United States. And Anthea, you were talking about um, the influence of Mormons and the influence of other, so, so, and we're gonna to get to Patrick in a second because back when you were, when JFK was the president, we did not have this wide diversity of religions, but what about the influence, Anthea, of those other religious groups besides the Catholics, besides the evangelicals, besides the mainline Protestants? 
Yeah, I think this is really important because, you know, we did have a presidential candidate who sort of was like a, a new age kind of person, right, on mm -hmm. the Democratic side. So I think we have to start to pay attention to everybody who's in this mix. And so when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about, you know, what, what are Hindus thinking about this election cycle because Kamala Harris was there? How, you, you know, th did that motivate people to vote for the Democratic Party when they might not have otherwise, even though we see a lot of you know, conservatism right now in Modi's government in India, for example. So that's, that's one way to think about this. What, another way to think about this is in terms of how do we think about these populations that might not be considered to be you know, Christian or the nuns, essentially? How are those people voting in the midst of, this, of the election cycle? And what kind of things are they asking for that are not connected to religious freedom. And I thought about Mormons because I think Mormons are really important in this conversation because they sort of vote alongside evangelicals most of the time. Mm -hmm. But what we also saw was a pushback against Donald Trump and, and these kinds of politics. And, you know, Mitt Romney has always been one of his people who he's, he's sparred with, right? And part of that is about moral issues. And I think as I told, I, I was in Utah a couple of years ago and I said to people at the LDS, I said, you know, you were poised to take on the moral fiber where evangelicals have left it behind. In other words, they, have, they are able in some ways to talk about moral issues in ways that evangelicals themselves cannot anymore because of their support of Donald Trump. And so I don't know whether or not that will happen, but I think what this election cycle told us in 2020 is that we have a situation in America where we have a lot of religious diversity, we have to think about it, but then there's one more thing, and I do have to bring this up and I don't wanna muddy the waters, but we have to think about what do you think about Q? Mm -hmm. And Q is a very interesting thing because you have evangelicals who are part of this, you have people who I, I would kind of call them NASCAR Christians who never go to church, but they, they do have a Christian background, but they believe these conspiracy theories. And so part of what was going on, and we have to admit this at January 6th, is that it wasn't just about an insurrection, it was a religious insurrection in a lot of ways, because you had both evangelicals and Q people, and sometimes they were both together in one person, who believed these kinds of beliefs that Donald Trump was really supposed to be the president, the election was stolen from them. And I think this is the moment where, in a, in a conversation about religion and politics, we have to really think about how politics have become religion in America. And I think that's a real key focus that I've been thinking about lately and thinking about what it is that we have to do about that, but we can talk about that then. Well, that's a good point because there are many members of the GOP who have been loath to denounce QAnon, which people mm -hmm. may know as this idea that there's a bunch of uh, pedophiles and devil worshipers in the Democratic Party, including Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, and oddly enough, Tom Hanks. I never really get that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, abusing children and apparently eating babies and all these horrible things, it, but, but some people do believe it. Patrick, I want to get you in here uh, uh, because back, you're an expert on John F. Kennedy and his Catholicism. Back when he was running for president, became the first president, we were not talking about this great diversity of religions, the United States. What was the what was the template like then? Sure, thank you. And it strikes me that today, oftentimes politics and ideology is a way of gaining access to a person's moral core. So whenever we want to find out whether somebody you know thinks you know in any way about anything, we ask them about their politics, and we know how divisive that's been in recent years. So instead of talking about religious families today or denominations, we talk about ideology. And if you vote a certain way, that's your moral core. It says something profound about you. Um, that wasn't the case in the 1960s. In the 1960s, at least the early 1960s, it was quite the opposite. So religion was a way of gaining access to a person's core um, and figuring out their politics. And that's exactly what happened with John F. Kennedy. Now on paper, Kennedy was a perfectly uh, conventional Catholic. He checked all the boxes, even though Belatedly, there was a debate about whether he was a good Catholic, a bad Catholic, whether he was good for Catholicism or not. Um, and certainly there have been revelations since his time in office that have said something about that. Uh, the fact is that he checked all the boxes. Now, Kennedy himself, during the campaign of 1960, um, did not really debate whether he wanted to run as a conventional Catholic or wanted, whether he wanted to run against the Catholic Church, per se. 
Um, the question was whether um, he could separate himself enough from his church to gain the confidence of American Protestants. And ultimately he gained far fewer votes um, among Protestants than Adlai Stevenson did in 56, but he won 80% of Catholics and that with um, the Jewish vote as well. And those are the denominations for which we have figures. Um, and that speaks to your question about diversity. We don't know, you know, the Muslim population was small at that time, at least compared to today. Um, Hindu and so forth, Mormons as well. So we have very few statistics on how other groups voted, but the Jews and Catholics were strong enough in support of, Ka of Kennedy to push him over. And of course it didn't resolve the issue at all because he had to prove to American Protestants that a Catholic could fulfill his oath of office or eventually her oath of, of office um, and to um, meet you know, whatever Supreme Court stipulation there, there was concerning his about his Catholic faith. Um, so that was 1963. He didn't really do so until he found a religious climate in which he could speak openly um, about a little bit. Um, and he himself was an agent of religious dialogue within the White House, even though the American public saw very little about this um, or very little of this. Uh, the reality is that he invited like-minded people of faith to the White House to discuss progress on racial justice, um, the nuclear arms ban treaty, and a few other key issues that were crucial to his legacy. So really that kind of opening up and that transformation of American politics to religion didn't happen until his last year in office and thereby creating kind of these new categories that we're more familiar with. So instead of having people identified explicitly in politics as Catholics of having a religious left and a religious right. Um, again, that took time to happen, it didn't meld you know, suddenly during Kennedy's time in office, it happened over the course of the 60s and 70s. Um, but basically what I do in my book is I trace back our current political climate to the early 1960s when people found like-minded allies in other religious traditions. But the Catholic vote for Biden and maybe EJ, uh, you'd be the person to weigh in here, was divided very much. Right. Well, the I was looking up the number and I had it on my phone here. I, let me just while I pull it up, um, a couple of things. I think it's first of all, to Anthea's earlier point, I think it's very important to remember a great book written by a sociologist uh, called Will Herberg. It was called Catholic Protestant Jew. And it argued that at that moment in 19, late 50s America, they were all united by a kind of Americanism. Will Herberg was fairly conservative, absolutely brilliant sociologist. If we, he redid that, if he were still alive, that book would now have to be called Catholic, Protestant, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, Confucian, Jain. The amount of diversity in the country now compared to then because of immigration, specifically because of the 1965 Immigration Act, which shifted immigration away from Europe and toward other parts of the world is extraordinary. And that's just a big fact about religion. The second thing in terms of JFK is, I, I think when you compare Biden and JFK, JFK in order to get elected basically had to say, I'm not very Catholic, don't worry about it. Uh, because that's essentially what that speech to uh, the Houston ministers that's so famous where he basically said, my religion isn't going to have anything to do with the fundamental decisions I make. And if that ever happens, I'll quit. But don't worry, because that'll never happen. Joe Biden, on the other hand, comes under great criticism, particularly from conservative Catholics, because he does not take the church line, does not, or in their view, is unorthodox on issues like abortion, like gay marriage. Uh, and so he has to prove, no, no, I really am uh, Catholic, and that there was, he's, and, and he does that certainly through his religious practice. I, I, I'm, I'm always kind of, I get all of the press releases from the press polls, and I always get a kick out of the fact that there Joe Biden is at four o'clock mass on a uh, Saturday afternoon. I mean, he's there. He's there on the holy days of obligation. Uh, and so, you know, he is a, he is a practicing Catholic, but it's a very different thing from where John Kennedy was. And, you know, when in terms of the vote, white Catholics voted for Trump 52 to 44 percent. Um, Hispanic Catholics voted 67, 26 uh, for Biden. Um, so Trump's share of the Catholics was good enough. It's it's there are two ways to look at this. You look at it and say, well, gee, he lost the Catholics. 
But the Catholics, um, I always say there is no Catholic vote and its importance, um, by which I mean there is not a monolithic Catholic vote, but there is a big swing vote. And Catholics happen to be located in very important places, among them Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, and he won back enough of them from where Hillary Clinton was that he carried those states. So it was very important, even though he only got 44% of the white Catholics. Let's talk a, a little bit about uh, the intersection of uh, religion and the Supreme Court, the intersection of religion and immigration. <clears throat> All over the news today has been this growing tragedy at the border with a lot of unaccompanied uh, 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 children um, are being held longer than they should be held. They haven't been moved yet uh, out of those really jail-like situations. It's a repeat of what we saw with differences, obviously, but a repeat of what we saw earlier in the, in the Trump administration. Where does the, the religious American play into uh, dealing with immigration? Anybody who wants to weigh in, just go ahead. Andy, you're muted. And, and Sorry, I did it because there was a motorcycle came by and I didn't want you all to hear that. <laughs> I think this is a complicated issue. And, and the reason why it's complicated is because for, as we said before, lots of uh, religious groups do care about immigrants. They, they do care, but how they care is different, okay? So if we wanna start off with Catholicism, this has been a big thing for the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. They have said, you know, we need to do better on the border. We need to do this. And part of the reason why is because a lot of the immigrants who are coming are Catholics, right? And they, and they want to be able to welcome them into parishes. And so that's the first thing that I think that's important to say up front. But at the same time, we have people who are very much against immigrants coming in because they have believed the law and order line. And so it's like when, when we went back, back to 2016, unfortunately in the election cycle, when Trump vilified this and began to shut down immigration. And we can't just talk about this as immigration on the Texas, you know, New Mexico, Arizona and California border. We gotta talk about the whole immigration thing. And so when we talk about the Muslim ban that happened, and how people couldn't come into this country and they already had visas and everything and they're ready to come in. And other kinds of people from religious groups that did not get to come in because of this. So I, you know, when I hear everybody say the crisis on the border, I'm like, which one? Because we've got a crisis on every border. And it's not just about, you know, caravans of people trying to come over in the Southwest. It's about people who've been locked out of this country, not just because of coronavirus, but because they were stopped because of the immigration policies that happened. So you have Somalis who couldn't come in, people who were refugees from these other countries like Iraq and all these other places that could not come in because Trump set up this immigration policy. Now, to be fair, and we gotta be fair, we gotta go back to, the, to you know, Obama's administration to talk about what happened with immigrants there. And so people were getting picked up then too. It just didn't make the radar screens like everybody else. And so I think what, what we have here is an issue for religious groups. How will they deal with it? Will they be welcoming to the stranger if we talk about Christian, you know, the, the Christian way to do this? Are they gonna say immigrants are bad, which is a lot of what a lot of evangelicals unfortunately say, at the same time wanting to, you know, get that? How do Mormons feel about this who have had issues about immigration because they were treated badly in this country and so they've always been welcoming to immigrants? There's a lot of ways to look at this and parse it out, but I do think what the most important thing is about this is that we do have an issue about what are we going to do with this? And that was the biggest thing that's facing the Biden administration, one of the big things that's facing Biden's administration right now, and will end up being part and parcel of the cleanup work that he has to do in the midst of a pandemic to deal with you know, this crisis that we're having of people who don't have a place to be and kids who are just being held who could be sent off to relatives who are already here in the US and it just needs to be smoothed out. And that's not even to bring up the final thing, the kids that were taken apart from their parents and their parents shit back. That is a heinous thing. This is the thing that I always say about, you know, the evangelicals who supported Donald Trump. This is where I get really mad and say, you supported a man who separated parents from their children. And, and, and you have to understand what it is you, you came up for. So every religious group that did that has to understand that they have played a part 
and this separation of children by supporting somebody who did this maliciously. Did you want to say something? Uh, I just want to say you're know, talking of borders. Uh, I can't resist pointing out that this is the only panel south of Quebec with two people with French names on a third of the panel is uh, French. So there is that border that looms very large for some of us um, historically. And I've always had you know, a lot of empathy for people on second languages because English is actually my second language. So, uh, but I want to just say something about the church. I think this is an extraordinary opportunity for Biden uh, to forge an alliance, particularly with the Catholic Church. Bishop Gomez out in LA put out that statement the day he was inaugurated that was very critical of Biden. It even kind of, it suggested he was cooperating with evil on abortion. Um, and incidentally, we, we really haven't talked much about abortion. I do think for all the stuff we've said, there are there is a serious right to life constituency, a serious anti-abortion constituency that is also part of the appeal Trump had. We can argue about it. We can note that it's also connected to race, but that's a real issue for people. But Gomez, who criticized Biden on abortion, is very pro-immigration. Uh, Cardinal Malley in uh, Boston is one of the most pro-immigration voices, one of the greatest friends Latinos have uh, in the United States. I think when it comes to placing these kids and we have to move these kids as quickly as we can to decent situations. I think the Catholic Church in particular, but churches in general, could do an enormous amount of good work to try to get kids out of detention and into better uh, situations. And one would imagine in particular that there are a lot of Latino Catholic parishes, there are also a lot of Latino evangelicals, by the way, whom I think would want to help these kids. And I really hope the White House reaches out to religious groups uh, because I think it's a practical thing to do. I think it would be a politically smart thing to do. And um, better yet, it would be a moral thing to do. <laughs> Sermon, were you trying to weigh in here? I'm sorry. Go ahead if you had something to say. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I, you know, I think there are many uh, ways in which I could approach this question. And you know, we could say what to what do Sikh say, or what do Hindu say, or what do Muslims say about immigration? But I want to share a, a personal perspective that's that might actually speak to what we're seeing around the country. And so, if we take a step back and, and we look at what's happening, um, for someone like me, whose whose community isn't powerful or visible enough uh, to have influence, um, I'm seeing people in my community, including myself. Uh, seeing what's happening on the border, seeing what's happening to these kids being separated, seeing the Muslim ban, all of these injustices that have now become surfaced and saying, this is unacceptable to us. We'll do whatever we can to help out, right? This has become, as you're saying, AJ, it's, it's a moral issue and it's an issue of basic human decency. And, and what has emerged from that, I think, is this multi-faith movement for justice in which you now have coalitions of communities who have nothing to do with each other historically or traditionally, uh, but now we're showing up and saying, hey, you know what? We're, we're here together to, to help improve US immigration policy because we recognize this is, this is a faith issue. Uh, we're here to help with uh, white supremacy because we now see that this is a faith issue. We, we're here to show up for healthcare and, and health equity, because now we're seeing, so I think what's happened over the past four years is this, this, um, this uncovering of, of cracks that have been there all along. And now all of a sudden, the, the coalescing of various communities, and I think this is incredibly important, that, that you, know, you haven't seen this in, in, at least in my lifetime, we haven't seen a, a, a religious left a progressive multi-faith movement for justice. And now that's coming out. And, and now you're seeing folks like Biden or Buttigieg or Kamala Harris leaning into their faith identities and talking about faith openly in the political context because it has power, because it speaks to people because it's coming from a place of morality. And so that's, that's been my experience and it's, it's happening for people all around me who, who really feel this, this urge to, to do better personally and, and nationally. Well, that's a great point because I've certainly read a lot about how it was 
previously, I think, to a, this is a generalization, but the idea was that the Republicans were the ones that were going to church. And the Democrats may have been going to church, but they didn't talk much about it. That, uh, and it, it seems to have changed. It, it uh, said. I, I don't know if it's changed other than who's saying what. I mean, I, I, who knows if that's true or not, you know, but I think with, with they're, Cimarron is- they're, they're not really going, they're just saying, <laughs> Going out. Right, right. Which is, which is, which is, you know, they're also saying that they're not racist, right? I mean, yeah. so you know, what what are we going to believe? But what Simran is saying here is really important to me because I've always believed that as human beings, as human beings, we rise to the occasion when there is mass suffering that is experienced by a whole lot of people. You you see the best of humanity in these moments, whether it's localized, you know, uh, or regionalized, you know, here in, in Boston, you have the, the bombing from the, from the Boston Marathon, you know, you have 9-11. In these moments where people may articulate the isms and the obias, but when that trauma happens, everybody rushes to assist one another. And I think what Simran is saying is here is if there's a great cry, I think the lives of these precious young people who should have a bright and thriving, flourishing future. I think that's going to lead to all kinds of coalitions that will actually supersede and surpass what we're seeing with BLM and what we're seeing with AAPI and what we're seeing with so many other moments that are occurring in this current generation, which we have not seen in this way before. And so I am hopeful here. I think we all need to pull up our sleeves and roll up our pants legs and get busy working. But, but there is something here that, that is important for us to do. Patrick, I just wonder what was going on in the early 60s with John Fitzgerald Kennedy and immigration? Sure, thank you for that question. And you know, just, to, just as a rejoinder to some of the prior points, it's really interesting to know that usually when we talk about the religious left, we think of the 1960s um, and this mobilization of people of faith towards social justice. Um, and to a great extent, the white people who get involved, you know, take a leaf out of uh, the book of Black Liberation and Prophetic Religion um, and their key white allies who participate in huge events like the Conference on Religion and Race that takes place in 1963. Um, and actually Kennedy is kind of informally uh, represented there by Sergeant Shriver. So Shriver goes. Um, and the people who also attend, who belong to white Protestant or the white Catholic community, um, finally come to terms with the new way of framing issues um, and absorb some of that rhetoric and are inspired to join um, African-Americans in their campaign for the end to segregation and discrimination. Um, and that's really what lays the basis for the religious left, that and uh, the meeting of these different groups, oftentimes long terms that are uh, presented by the White House, as, as I mentioned, many of these meetings actually take place at the White House, uh, but it expands from there. The problem oftentimes in the 1960s is that as liberal as clergy might be or pastors or ministers or priests or rabbis, their flocks have to be dragged kicking and screaming. And oftentimes, you know, priests and pastors lose their pulpits because they're too far ahead of their flocks. And that might be what happens here again. I, I wanna be hopeful as well as Emmett is, um, but oftentimes there is that resistance and that's really happened in the 1960s with the silent majority. Um, as we know, for a lot of Catholics, it was one step too far to go from the silent majority to the moral majority of the 1970s, but they were still very conservative and still very reluctant to see major social change in their backyards. Um, and that also happened on the immigration issue. I think there was also greater openness to immigration on the Catholic side in the 1960s because they had that recent history, whether they were Italian or Irish or French Canadian or you know some of these other groups that had recently come or within living memory had come to the US, they had that openness and were at least more willing to open up the doors of the country than to open up their suburban you know, houses to people of different races and creeds and um, who are just very different from their own experience. So again, the, the, I think there's a similarity there to be put between Catholics then, Catholics today, um, but I see a lot of entrenched barriers still being present, the same that we saw in the 1960s. Yeah, I want to- Could, get... I, could I just oh, say- go ahead, sure. Yeah, just a, a real quick. Um, on the one hand, one can be 
analytically a bit cynical about everything and say that right now, um, what passes for religion is often politics. Uh, and that what you have really are conservative Protestants, conservative Catholics, conservative Jews, and others, uh, for that matter, conservative atheists all on the one side, and more progressive Catholics, Jews, um, Protestants, atheists, and others, Muslims on the other side. And so um, it's really the almost, the, it's something I think people in the churches, in our religious institutions, have to think really hard about has politics simply superseded religion in defining people's identities. Uh, so that's on the one side, and I think that's a serious question. On the other side, there has been a religious left, a religious progressive movement going all the way back to before the turn of the last century. Um, obviously, I mean, you go back to Frederick Douglass, uh, who was a religious political activist and uh, the, you know, the abolition movement and the anti-slavery movement. Um, go back to the social gospel, um, which also as the, um, you know, Skip Gates's documentary that uh, Anthea was a star in um, showed that the social gospel had a real influence on the black church and there were some alliances built there. And the Catholic bishops have a uh, little known now, I would love them to trot it out again, the 1919 program for social reconstruction that the Catholic bishops put together. If you go back to that document, it was really, it prefigured the New Deal. Um, it was a very progressive document about the economy. And so I think the religious left has always been there and it's waxed and waned at different points in its effectiveness. Marjorie, you and I are, um, of an age where we remember the days of the Berrigan brothers. Um, and we remember a lot of different strands of the religious left. Mike Harrington, the great American socialist, before he became an atheist, was a Catholic worker and was part of Dorothy Day's movement. But I agree with the general sentiment here that I think, and Biden may help this along, I think there is a bit of a reappearance uh, as a uh, uh, Simran said, of a stronger religious progressive movement. That's partly a hope on my part, given my politics, but I think there is something going on that could be important there. Uh, let's try to talk a little bit about the Supreme Court. As most people know, six Catholics on the Supreme Court now. Neil Gorsuch was born a Catholic, now he's an Episcopalian, so he's the seventh. There's two Jewish justices. A lot of uh, litigation involving freedom of religion, which some people would say is foisting your religion on other people. But in any case, um, what do we think about the Supreme Court where we have had three justices appointed uh, by Donald Trump out of the Federalist Society with hopes that they are going to uh, influence the court in a very conservative way? Anybody like to weigh in on the, what the Supreme Court is going to be doing in the next upcoming months and years? Go ahead. I just spoke. Go ahead, somebody. Yeah, I, I, yeah. somebody else take this one first. I, I was just going to say it's not a question of weighing in because I think we always think about the court as the first place to start. I think we have to talk about also the 200 plus judges that he's appointed that they just did on the loop because it's not just about the Supreme Court. It's about all of these judges that Donald Trump appointed and what that's going to do on the state level about issues like abortion and, and even same sex marriage and all of these things, I think that there's going to be a play to take some of this down. I like to hear what everybody else said, but Let me make, that's what I just wanted to say first. Yeah. Let me make two quick points here. And, 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 and Dr. Butler's right on the money. It's about the bandwidth of these judges because how the cases are framed that even make it up to the Supreme Court really dictate how the Supreme Court is supposed to respond to the framing of the cases. And so, you know, that that's one issue. The other issue, I don't think that most everyday lay people, American citizens have any inclination as to the religious beliefs of these Supreme Court justices. I think they think, uh, as EJ just mentioned, about whether they're conservative or whether they're, you know, liberal. I think they also listen to whatever the sound chamber from the fishbowl that they receive their information from. And so I'm not sure that people think about the religious life of these justices until they watch like a panel like this. And then they say, oh, wow. And then it's ironic to many people 
that you would have so many conservative Catholics because in many lay people's perspective, Catholics don't necessarily are perceived as conservative. You think about another religious group as conservative and not necessarily Catholic. So I think that that's an interesting play, you know, in terms of how do we not only deal with a narrative, but who controls the narrative? I think Catholic conservatives have been very important as kind of intellectual figures on the religious right uh, as a whole. I had a dear conservative evangelical friend who alas is no longer with us, who used to say that he felt as a conservative Protestant that uh, conservative evangelicals often uh, leaned on Catholic natural law theory and other kinds of Catholic ideas to uh, create a substructure for their religious beliefs. So it's not shocking that you have a whole bunch of conservative Catholics on the court. On the other hand, the most progressive justice arguably is Justice Sotomayor, uh, who is also from uh, is also a Catholic from the Catholic tradition. I think what you're going to see on church state cases is the First Amendment has two halves. One talks about the free exercise of religion, and the other says Congress shall make no law with respect to the establishment of religion. Uh, a certain liberal jurisprudence tends to lean hard on the first part, and that's where a strong sense of church-state separation comes from. I think more conservative jurisprudence leans more on the free exercise part a lot of the time, uh, where all kinds of things are seen as infringements on free exercise, thus the uh, law is trying to say that a baker can't be forced to bake a cake for a gay wedding. I think what you're going to see with this court is a really hard turn on free exercise jurisprudence. And I think what you're going to see on the liberal side is liberals more reluctant <clears throat> to go to court on certain matters uh, because they don't want to create cases. And they don't want to create cases because they think cases will let this very conservative Supreme Court create new law. I think it's going to be a fascinating period to watch the strategizing of people on the separationist side or the more liberal side as to what issues they decide to litigate in this period, including, by the way, the Biden administration. You know, it has been interesting that I think nine times since late fall, the Supreme Court has sided uh, with churches and synagogues that wanted to uh, get around COVID limits on, on worshipers. Um, I, I didn't know what to make of that. There's legitimate reasons. You don't want people on top of each other <laughs> singing at the top of their lungs. So take it away. Anybody would like to weigh in on that. What's your reaction to that? Patrick, you want to weigh in here? I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been, I feel like you haven't been talking enough, Patrick. You have any opinion on the Supreme Court letting everybody come into some of these big mega churches? <laughs> Well, I personally would practice my faith differently. Um, you know, there are different ways of celebrating your faith. And um, I think that there, that takes a lot of personal initiative. It takes a lot of initiative from pastors who want to protect their flocks and who can find other ways around some of these restrictions. Um, that stretches way beyond the scope of religion, of course. Uh, it's, you know, kind of a pro-business approach as well. A lot of businesses have been keen to as much as they can provide for or protect their um, their staff to stay open because they have legitimate concerns about their ability to make it through. So I think this is where, this is a place where we haven't talked much about this, but where capitalism and the market and the market of religion meet. Um, and that's certainly a place where the Supreme Court will be more than happy to, as you've pointed out, to accommodate a lot of these, not just mega churches, but religious institutions in general. I I gotta say, I get the uneasiness that you know, some of the more conservative religious people have about shutting down churches through state power. Just as a, as a theoretical matter, I can see why they are upset by that because for uh, parts of our community, this is true of a lot of Orthodox Jews as well, um, shutting this down is to shut down an essential piece of their lives. I have admired thus the pastors and religious leaders in these communities who've said, we have to shut down even though we don't want to uh, because the danger of spreading this disease, which is a killer disease, is too great. And I thought it was really striking that this is one issue 
um, which Justice Roberts voted with the quotes liberals in saying that this is an area where the state has the right to do this because it's not treating religion any differently than it's treating other, uh, you know, as long as it's basically treating religion like it's treating other places. I think the conservatives always had their best case on this when they said, well, gee, it's okay to open certain kinds of places, but not churches. But then again, churches with the singing, with the clo close proximity of where a particular source of spread. And that was a terrible problem in, the, in all of this litigation. Yeah, we're going to go to questions in about three or four minutes. And I'll be looking at my cell phone, not because I'm surfing the net, but because the tech questions are going to be texted to me. So I just want to point that out if I'm looking at, at my phone. But before we go there, I mentioned to you all before we, we started tonight that um, look a little bit at the future of the intersection of religion and politics. I was fascinated by the story about Beth Moore. People may know she's got this $15 million ministry, very popular with conservative women. She declared she was no longer going to remain with the Southern Baptists over their support of Donald Trump, over their sexism, nationalism. Someone that I admired greatly was Rachel Held Evans, a young writer who died in her late 30s, but um, two years ago. But she also had left her um, church, her very conservative church, upset about the treatment of LGBT issues, sexism again. Um, that is happening. Some of these prominent uh, uh, conservative women breaking from their church. And also we have these continuing reports about the nuns, so no religious affiliation. I think 30% of the young people are in that uh, category, young adults in the United States. So I just wonder where you see, and this is obviously a huge broad question, but just going forward, where you see religion's role in politics five years, 10 years down the road? It's a huge question, I know, but um, has anyone thought much about that? Yeah, I'll, jump, I'll take a stab at this. I mean, what's interesting about this moment and, you know, Beth Moore is a, was a, is a mega superstar within SBC. Yeah. Um, Black women have been leaving these spaces for a long time. Uh, 2018, you know, hashtag Black Exodus. Um, you, know, uh, you know, our dear colleague Jamar Tisby now has, you know, hashtag, you know, leave loud. Um, and so the notion is that people have been traumatized by uh, a slave owner theology in some of our communities and by a nationalistic theology that has, that has lost its grasp on following Jesus in, within the Christian spaces. And so um, it, it's not a new thing, um, but it is a notion of kind of a 2.0 on a liberation theology where folks are not necessarily losing their faith. They're exploring new opportunities to express it. So these nons, you know, non-denominational congregations, non-denominational praxis um, become important spaces for people to find their agency and recover their embodied experience as people. And I think that's extremely important uh, in this season and moving forward. Uh, but it's nothing new. I mean, you know, you can go back to St. George's Methodist uh, Church in Philadelphia, where Absalom Jones and, and, and Richard Allen, you know, and, and a whole cohort of Black folks walked out of the church because, the, you know, the, the white folks said they were praying too long. Now, what kind of religion do you get kicked out of church for praying too long? So, I mean, so this is nothing new. Okay. Does anyone add, add quickly before we go to the audience questions? Yeah, just one thing. I think um, it's really hard to predict because there's one thing that we haven't really brought up very much, but it's very much present and it's why we're all not together tonight and that's coronavirus. Yeah. And, and I think that this is going to change everything. And the political ways in which religions in interact with politics, what they do, even if we think back to how people said it was religious freedom that they needed to meet instead of not you know, quarantining, when we started back on this, it's going to affect every religious group in this country. And I think what we can't predict right now are the ways in which there's going to be attrition and, and re-evaluation uh, re and readjusting because of what, has, what happens with the pandemic. Uh, just a real quick point in terms sure. of nuns. The nuns are, I, I think the rise of the nuns up to like 40% now, the polls keep moving about among uh, young people. Uh, who are religiously unaffiliated. And yes, some of them have an interest in spiritual things, 
uh, but they are really sort of have turned their backs and gotten, in many cases, angry at traditional forms of organized religion. And we were talking earlier about the religious left, I think pulling a lot of young people out of traditional religion, they are disproportionately progressive, the ones who are leaving. Uh, and that will leave many of our denominations, particularly predominantly white denominations, as more conservative than they were 20 uh, or 30 years ago. I think that the secession of the young is creating a real, if you will, successor generation problem for more progressive forms of white Christianity. And it's beginning, I think, to affect, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's beginning to have an impact on the black church uh, as well. Um, and that could create this is an, uh, I, I'm usually an optimistic person, but I think this could increase the kinds of polarization we have uh, around religion, which is one reason why I'm hoping for something of a resurgence of religious progressivism, because I don't think it will help us if we further polarize around religion going down the road. <clears throat> okay, you, you ready for some questions here? These are from our audience. We appreciate uh, Liz Murphy for passing these along to me. That's why I'm looking at my phone again. Okay, how do you see religious issues playing us in playing us in U.S. foreign policy? Excuse me, that's United States foreign policy. How different is this likely to be under President uh, Biden than former President Trump? Anybody want to take up foreign policy? I just oh, go ahead. Oh. So, I, I was just going to say, I'm not sure that the religious component was ever all that important. Uh, you know, it may have been uh, lip service. I don't think the issues on either side in either Biden's case or Trump's case are going to be about religion. Um, and I think that with China, I think there will continue to be an we just saw it with that showdown up in Alaska. Um, there is that we are much farther apart from the, this Chinese government and given what it's doing in Hong Kong and elsewhere, uh, whether the administration is Republican or Democratic, I think there's a real uh, drift uh, there. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, a big difference is, I think that Biden would like a rapprochement slightly with the Iranians, at least to reinstate the old deal that Obama had putting a lid on their uh, uh, uranium. But again, I don't think that is about religion either. So I think there'll be some substantial changes, like we will welcome allies more. There will be areas of continuity where I think our relations with China are going to be scratchy. I just don't think any of it has much to do with religion. I'm happy to be corrected on that if anybody has a different view. I, I would just say that I think that what's different about this maybe will be the ways in which this administration deals with Israel. So that's gonna be number one, yeah. because whether or not we wanna think that's religious, that's religious for a lot of people. And I do think the issue about China will be interesting because I think Biden has a tough thing. And I think a lot about Uyghur Muslims. I think yeah. about what's happening with the Uyghurs and this is not something that gets talked about a lot, but I think we need to understand that there could actually be, you know, genocide happening right now. And we, and we have not heard anything from our government to talk about that for a lot of different reasons. But I think that's a really important element of how religion might play into foreign policy on this. So I'd I be think, interested to see what happens. I think Biden and Tony Blinken have talked about the Uyghurs. They have, okay, not, then, I'll, then I'll, you know. If I'm not mistaken, but St. Google can help us on that. Somebody yes. out there. <laughs> yes. A lot, a couple of notes in, in terms of what what I see changing uh, potentially and 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 probably uh, with this administration. Um, one is, and, and we saw this especially in the Trump administration, um, the notion of religious freedom was highly politicized uh, to focus on the um, discrimination against Christians all over the world, and that's where the emphasis of um, of Trump's administration was with regard to religious freedom. I think that changes. That's one. Um, I think the second, um, where, where we see a change uh, is in instances um, where there is uh, severe religious oppression and violence uh, against minoritized religious communities in places like Myanmar, 
uh, where there has not been much of an, an attempt at intervention within the Trump administration. So that's two. I think three is with regard to how we think about and talk about um, the global Muslim communities. Um, and especially when, when we're coming out of an administration that proposed uh, a, a presumptive ban on anyone who is Muslim. Um, I, I think that we're already seeing a significant shift in how we talk about uh, violence and terrorism perpetrated by people who identify with Islam. Uh, and so that's three. And then, and then I'll say the, the thing that I don't see changing much, and this is unfortunate to me, uh, is that all of this um, only, only happens in contexts where there is economic benefit. And, and one, of the, one of the reasons that, I mean, we all know why this happens, but one of the reasons that I say this um, is, is that just coming out of this, this past week, as, as we've mentioned, um, the, the Biden administration's unwillingness uh, to take on India in a context of uh, rising autocracy and, and ethno-nationalism, incredibly violent um, under, under Modi's leadership, that's, that's not changing. Um, and, and that is specifically because of the, the perception that India is a strategic ally, uh, you know, uh, uh, against, uh, against China um, and, and its growth against Pakistan and quote unquote Islamic terrorism. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, uh, it's strategic allyship and partnership as, as an economic uh, powerhouse. And so I think, I think that's the part where we don't see religious freedom changing in context uh, where it doesn't benefit us economically. Here's another question. Are there issues around which faith values can bring us together? Treating all people with dignity should equal anti-racism, voting rights, et cetera. Can religion help moderates be less conservative? I'll jump, jump in here. Yes, um, please I do. Can, uh, but just to kind of jump back to what um, EJ was pointing out earlier, there's this huge segment of young people in their 20s and 30s who are now increasingly, not necessarily alienated from religion per se, but suspicious of the intersection of faith and politics because their only experience of faith and politics so far has been the religious right, the Christian right specifically. Um, and so they're worried about the moment they hear religion and politics, that's what their mind goes to. So I want to be hopeful once again and think that religion can be that common vehicle where people can assert moral truths and you know rally around them and rally for either social change or for justice and equity. Um, but that means a conversion <laughs> of sorts for young people to bring them into the fold and to be able to be empathetic towards people of faith to help them understand that these are potential allies um, that religion is not necessarily or at all the problem with politics. It's how that religion is expressed and the values around which that religion is organized. So again, I want to be hopeful, um, but I think it will take a lot of outreach and a lot of goodwill on both sides among people who are unaffiliated, um, who might know, not know much about religion writ large, uh, who've been kind of on the outskirts of religious discourse, and people of faith who are willing to engage in that hard work of reaching out and bringing them into these moral causes. Because young people have moral cores as well and moral centers. They just don't express it necessarily in religious terms. So if we can overcome that suspicion, I think it's absolutely possible to do, um, to engage in that hard work for sure. I would, I would love to see more practical work done by religious congregations, not just Christian across the board with each other uh, in the work of charity and justice. All the great religious traditions have a lot to say about compassion and charity, and also they have a lot to say about justice. In principle, uh, they should all agree on the scandal of homelessness. In principle, they should all agree on wanting to help this oh, no. stranger, as, as many forms of scripture uh, tell us. Um, in principle, they want to help battered women. In other words, there are a whole series of things where if you look at individual efforts by a lot of traditions, they do some good stuff for people. They don't always do it together. Um, and, you know, the new head of um, the White House Faith-Based Office is a very dear friend of mine, Melissa Rogers. And Melissa and I have done a lot of work together. We actually wrote a paper right before the election on what the next president should do in this area. And 
I think that Biden really does have in mind, and Melissa certainly has thought about this all her life, of how can you bring people together in this work? And they have a particular commitment uh, to um, use to try to create alliances among religious people to fight embedded racism. Uh, and, um, you know, we've already said some of the racism is embedded in the churches themselves. Uh, and that's a fact. But I, I would love to see people trying to do this. I wish I could be optimistic about it. I think that the politicization is so deep. The divisions have been are, you know, so deep. Witness what happened at the Capitol on January 6th. Witness people not even being able to agree that Joe Biden won the election. So these divisions are really deep. But, you know, we all, I think every person on this panel knows somebody whose politics might be very conservative, who has a really good heart when it comes to a neighbor in trouble, when it comes to somebody uh, down the street who's in trouble and they want to help. And God knows it would be great if we could find ways of cooperating across political lines, because right now that's harder than across uh, religious lines. Anyone else? Okay. I'll add a quick word here, which is um, one of the one of the greatest uh, gifts that our that our religious traditions offer us is the practice of inter introspection, and I think that as as we've been getting into this world of anti racism and diversity and equity and inclusion and justice, one of the things uh, we've we've all learned is that this is internal work as much as it is ex external. And so the, the practices that our traditions teach us in terms of what does it look like to go inside yourself and excavate uh, these, these difficult or, or complex ideas and, and replace them with things that are beautiful. I think that's, that's part of the work that everyone in this country is, is grappling with right now. Uh, and, and our traditions give us a lot of insight on, on how to do that. So I, I find that to be a powerful practice. Marjorie remembers probably in Catholic school like I do, a, an examination of conscience. Remember that, Marjorie? Oh, and, Jesuits. I'm yeah. sorry? The Jesuits are big on that, right? Yeah, and, and uh, I, amen to what you just said. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, how do you think technology, TV, podcasts, social media, radio, talk shows, Facebook, et cetera, has affected organized religion and its political influence? Influencing everything, I think. <laughs> do, do you have hours? Uh, we could go for hours on this one, but <laughs> let me try to make it short. It's affected everything. How do you think that Q made it so big? Because Facebook helped Q to become big. It helped to spread cons conspiracy theories. Um, you know, Parler, all of these things really energized people right up before the insurrection. But I want to talk about this on another level, too. I think um, it used to be that we talked about televangelists all of the time. But there's plenty of religious broadcasting that's going on in podcasting and, you know, people who still blog, all of these things. I think we don't talk enough about the power of conservative Catholic television with Eternal Word Network. And I, that is huge. And that makes a big difference about how people see and, and think about their Catholicism right now. And so all of these things, it's always been a religion and media thing. Patrick knows this because I'm thinking about, um, you know, if we think back to the 1950s and the 60s, who was it that you saw on TV? You, you might have seen Billy Graham on a revival, but you also saw Fulton J. Sheen and you saw him every week. And so this, this may seem as though we're in this moment in time where we have a lot of religion and media and people are using this, but it's always been this way, especially in the 20th century. And I think that what we need to think about are the ways in which this has helped people stay connected throughout the pandemic. I think that's really very crucial and how people have kept their faith because they've been able to watch mass or they've been able to watch a service. They've been able to connect with people in different ways. And that's also put people together you know, for religion and politics in certain kinds of ways, especially the way in which Joe Biden handled you know, the 2020 election. I, you know, disclaimer, I was part of the Catholics for Biden and that was a big way that everyone connected with each other. And so I think the ways in which that has happened are all going to continue and it may even ramp up even more than what we've seen before. Patrick, what was Fulton Sheehan talking about? Life is worth living. That's um, right. Yeah, <laughs> they got his weekly broadcast and, you know, I agree entirely with Professor Butler. It's always been here, um, whether it was a 
or at least through the 20th century, whether it was a traveling preacher going from town to town, um, engaging in that kind of Billy Sunday type revival, um, or in the era of mass communication with, uh, you know, the power of positive thinking and Norman Vincent Peale being a superstar in his own day as a religious writer and pastor, um, who actually has an interesting connection to former President Trump as well. So yeah, it's always been around. Uh, so now people are finding new ways of communicating. And I think that what's happening with social media is that it's happening unbeknownst to a lot of other folks. So there are these sub channels and people are able to celebrate certain values or engage in certain political practice that um, are not regulated in any way uh, through just the, ma the power of you know, mass communication. Um, and that's what enables uh, groups like Q um, that I don't know much about, but um, you know, they, they're able to thrive in this new environment. So that's, what, that's my only kind of asterisk in this whole conversation is concern about what these new medias, which are also empowering people of faith, are also you know, exacerbating certain hateful groups. You know, one, one of the things about the technology and technology goes back to papyrus. I mean, so we, we, we've always had technology. The challenge, I think, is that now technology is not an aggregator. It's able to be access, accessed through solitude and loneliness. And so you have a whole lot of people being radicalized in a whole lot of different things because there's no relational connection to other people who are sharing in that experience. So you think about the technology of radio back in the 20s and 30s. Well, not everybody could afford a radio. So people would gather in certain people's spaces and listen to the radio together. And then you'd spend the rest of the night processing what you heard. Same thing with television. Same thing with cassettes. Same thing with CDs. But when you have in this season, 21st century, and, and particularly in the moment of a pandemic, a global pandemic, you have a lot of solitude and a lot of loneliness and a lot of isolation. And people are absorbing this information without having opportunities to process it, without having opportunities to air it out, and without having opportunities to, to really relationally work through it. And I think that that becomes an interesting challenge. I don't want to say whether it's positive or negative, but it's an interesting challenge for us to wrestle with, particularly young people. And here I'm talking about teenagers yeah. who, who have access to more information and most of it is not curated. And so when we get into the notion of truth and what's real and what's fiction, right, I think this becomes a very interesting challenge for us. I think everything that's been said is really good and insightful, I, and I appreciate it. And Professor Butler saying, look, and it goes all the way back. There were the, the evangelicals in the 30s were pioneers of the use of radio to spread uh, the gospel, even when they became kind of politically marginalized after prohibition. The way I look at technology is the good thing and the bad thing are the same which is the new technologies really help marginalized groups have a voice in a way they couldn't have before because it reduced the power of the gatekeepers. Now, there are some wonderful things about this. It lets groups whose views weren't heard, uh, who were discriminated against, it lets them into the conversation uh, in ways they couldn't, they were excluded from, but it also lets really kooky ideas uh, into the mainstream and that you, if you are in your town and only you and the guy down the street have this kooky idea, but then you discover all of a sudden there are like 2000 people in America who have the same kooky idea, suddenly you are a movement. Uh, and some kooky ideas are perfectly harmless. Some kooky ideas are actually dangerous to democracy. And, you know, we are advocates of press freedom and freedom of speech. So I don't want to crack down on this. I just want to say this is a technology that has, you know, as I say, the, the, the good thing and the bad thing about it are in a way the same thing. Um, and that's what we got to struggle with. I wanted to squeeze in at least one more question here. Um, an audience member is concerned about the separation of church and state and where that fits into these uh, trends. We are seeing a lot of court decisions involving religious freedom. Um, what does separation of church and state look like down the road? You want to weigh in? The, I'll just be brief. I want to, the, I mean, separation of church and state, it's worth pointing out, is not in the Constitution. It's a phrase that Thomas Jefferson used in the letter to the 
Danbury Baptist, what the First Amendment talks about is non-establishment of religion uh, and free exercise of religion. That's always been an argument that's gone on. Um, basically, we do believe in the separation of church and state in the sense that we do not want the, the state to um, in, you know, require anyone or favor any religion one over the other or interfere with those who are um, practicing. I think that Biden and the people he has around him on religion have a really acute sense of protecting um, the religious liberty of minorities in our country. We'll use that term, even though it's a vexed term, but the faiths that people don't pay attention to. Thus, he ended the Muslim ban. I think that people who are Sikhs and Hindus, as well as Christians and Jews and Muslims, will be able to have a voice in there, which I think is really important when we talk about religious liberty. That's a big part of it. Um, I think that they will go out of their way to um, to walk a line where they want to make progress on LGBTQ rights. Um, Biden is a pro-choice president. I think they are going to try to do that in uh, the best way they can without offending the sensibilities of religious people. But I think you're going to have some real friction on the edges uh, around those issues as to what, what people on the conservative side will see as a violation of their free exercise rights. And on the LGBTQ side, for example, they will see it as an attempt to find a religious backdoor to violate their rights. And that's, those are gonna be really tough uh, you know, questions facing this administration and facing us as a country in the next three years. I appreciate that, I agree with you there, EJ, and I'm, I'm, I'm right on board. Um, this, this was a, a point that I wanted to add earlier when we were uh, discussing the Supreme Court justices, and this seems like a nice opportunity to bring it back in, especially as you're invoking um, uh, underrepresented groups and marginalized religious communities. Um, you know, one of, one of the, let me start here. When, when Congresswoman Ohan Omar uh, first went in to serve in Congress, they had to change the rules on headwear so that she could wear her hijab because no one had ever done that before. And, and you know, what this says to me is I, I don't necessarily think when these rules were written uh, that they were meant to exclude someone like Ilhan Omar or someone like myself. But this is, how, this is what happens when you don't have the diverse group of people at the table making the rules. And so this is, I think this is, this is part of America's challenge now as we are becoming increasingly diverse um, and, and we're talking and we're grappling with uh, white supremacy openly, right? What does it look like to decenter whiteness so that all racial groups have equitable footing? I think we have to ask the same question about religious groups, right? What does it look like to decenter Christianity, which has been the de facto religion mm -hmm. of this country? And whether we want to admit it or not, it's true, right? These Christocentric policies have become deeply institutionalized in this country. These same things that Ilhan Omar dealt with when she first stepped in office, it's, these are challenges that I've been dealing with my entire life. In fact, if someone who looks like me and follows my tradition wants to serve in the US military, the world's largest employer, even today, they can't, they have to get a special exception because the rules don't allow for that. And so what kind of messages is our country sending the rest of the world, right? The world's largest employer says, you can treat this person differently because of their faith identity. That to me is the question that we have to learn to deal with. And, and, and you know, to go back to your question, Marjorie, if what, what does religion and politics look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now? It's this, it's this intense struggle as Christianity becomes decentered in the same way we are seeing with, with whiteness, right? What does it look like as, as diverse religious groups, different communities uh, come to gain increasing power in this country? It's not going to be easy and it's not gonna be clean, right? This is going to be a struggle, just like in every other instance of, of power changing hands or, or at least losing footing uh, as we've seen in world history. Simo, I'm just put my, that reminded me of one of the great stories about pluralism on this score. 
that when Keith Ellison was elected as the first Muslim member of Congress, he was getting a lot of grief. Gee, he's going to take the oath of office, not on the Bible. Is he going to take it on the Quran? So what did he do? He got Thomas Jefferson's Quran. In Thomas Jefferson's library, he had a translation of the Quran. Who was going to get in the way of Keith Ellison to swear on Thomas Jefferson's Quran? And it is about the, and partly it does take inventiveness to move us forward. And I just love that moment. Uh, Okay, we have five minutes. I want to be respectful of people's time. So I just thought we could kind of wrap this up with some words of wisdom from our panelists in the last uh, five minutes here. I'll just go around the Zoom screen here. Let's start with you, Emmett. Uh, what's the, I hate to use this dreaded cliche media word, but what the heck, what is your takeaway for the audience tonight on the intersection of religion and politics? I think I would say, you know, uh, pay attention to the details and move beyond sound bites and um, catchy words and phrases and actually do what we teach our young people to do, articulate your thoughts, right? Don't, don't, it, it, rather than use the one word, use two sentences so that people can actually know what you really are saying and what you really believe. And finally, I'll say, I hope that we can allow our hope to be stronger and greater than our fear. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. Patrick Lacroix. One thing that we haven't touched much upon, or at least we haven't directly, is the power of narratives and well entrenched narratives in our polity. Um, and the fact that, you know, the that's one area where President Trump, former President Trump, was extremely successful, is forging a very powerful and compelling narrative that resonated with a lot of people who saw themselves as being marginalized. Um, and we saw that recurrently in the field of religion in 2016, when he was running for president against Hillary Clinton, saying things like Hillary Clinton um, hates Catholics, Hillary Clinton hates Israel, um, arguing that he would repeal the Johnson Amendment, um, and you know, forging this religious narrative uh, that still speaks to a lot of people who still, um, I don't wanna say bind to that narrative, but certainly abide by that narrative. So I think that some of the hard work that we have to engage in as teachers, as journalists, as uh, researchers, uh, people who have some media platform is to start questioning those narratives um, and try to challenge those established um, power bases and help people approach these stories that we tell about ourselves very critically um, because we're not gonna make headway in terms of um, religious, interreligious discourse or dialogue or conciliation until we can confront reality with our preconceptions about other groups. Um, and that's at the top of you know, the list. Uh, there's so much fragmentation right now, so much polarization that until, kind of to rejoin what Emmett was saying just a moment ago, until we start disaggregating and explaining ourselves a little bit more, we're not gonna make a whole lot of progress in this country. Okay, we've got two minutes left, so we're going to have to divide them into three of you. Many words of wisdom. Let's start with you, Simran as Jeet Singh. Sure, I'll, I'll keep it super brief and just and just remind everyone that religion is political, uh, that, that we can talk about the relationship between religion and politics, but let's also remember that religion and the greatest religious figures who have walked this earth, right, whether it be Jesus or the prophet Muhammad or the Buddha or Guru Nanak, uh, these are political figures. And for a lot of people who think about their religious practice, politics and justice is a core part of that. And, and, and that's an important thing for us all to remember. Anthea Butler. Uh, I think the biggest thing, the takeaway we need to do right now is to remember that there are some things that are true and there are some things that we need to understand that are not true. And that now is a time when it's been very difficult for people, especially religious people, to try to sift through what is true and what is a lie. And I think that people need to think about being very careful about what they hear about other groups, what they think, and what the narrative is, as Patrick says. I think that there are narratives that have been created about certain groups that allow them to take the moral stand. And then the last thing I'll do is just show a cover of my book. <laughs> Because read read Andy's book, but, that's uh, the bottom line. But that, this, is, this is part of how we deconstruct some narratives and I think there's some really good work right now challenging some of the religion and politics narratives in this country. Thank and you. I'll, I'll be real quick. 
pay attention to the religion of the marginalized, uh, because I think that the voices of the suffering, the voices of those left out, are a call to conscience for all of us to go to uh, Simram's inward lookingness. And I always say, I like humility as a concept. I am also a newspaper columnist. I think newspaper columnists are seen probably rightly as the people with the least humility in the entire world. <laughs> but I have always loved Reinhold Niebuhr's line that we must look for the truth in our opponent's error and the error in our own truth. And I know I sin against that all the time, but I do know it's a sin and I do know that Niebuhr's right. And so that's what I struggle uh, to do. And I think we could use a lot of that around the country right now. Thank you very much to the Kennedy Library. Thank you very much to our great panel, Patrick Lacroix, E.J. Dion, Simran G. Singh, Emmett G. Price. See you in the studio soon, I hope, Emmett. <laughs> and Anthea Butler, congratulations on your new book. Thank all of you for tuning in tonight to this great forum. I hope you enjoyed yourself. That's it. Have a great evening. Thank you.